you can get the phone to ring. You might be able to get people to submit forms. If you're not responsive, you literally are, are flushing dollars down the drain. That's Kyle Backus, co-founder and managing partner of Denver-based personal injury firm, Backus & Schenker. I think that all along the path of the history of our law firm, we have tried to stay on the front side of technology, the front side of the marketing curve, and to try to uh, make sure that we are committed to change. And those that commit to change are committed to the future. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Kyle Backus to discuss the most impactful decisions he and his partner made as they scaled their law firm, as well as the numerous challenges they had to overcome as they grew their practice and became a market leader. We are fully aware that the only path to success is through making many, many, many mistakes. And we have made thousands of mistakes and uh, half of them were my idea and probably the other half were his idea. And uh, we have lived with each other's mistakes as we have become successful in the process. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Kyle Backus is the co-founder and managing partner of the Denver PI powerhouse, Backus & Shanker, one of the fastest growing law firms in the Western United States. We kicked off our conversation by talking about how, at the young age of 17, Kyle got his first taste of what it meant to practice law when he won his first argument in front of the Florida State Supreme Court. I wasn't a barred lawyer, of course, at 17, but you know, early on, I was in high school in Gainesville, Florida. There was an opportunity to spend a couple of days on a field trip up to Tallahassee to participate in legislative day. You got to, a choice of projects you could sign up for. And I signed up to participate arguing before a mock Florida uh, Supreme Court. And I really, to be honest, I was there because it was a chance to go up and spend a couple of days. There were going to be girls on the bus and uh, it was going to be an opportunity to kind of spread my wings a little bit and get out of Gainesville. And so went up and I think that the topic that we had to research was whether or not they should allow uh, cigarette advertising on TV, actually. And we had to do some research. I went up there. Nobody in my family is a lawyer, never had been to a law firm, never had spoken to a lawyer, did the research, participated in a group, and ended up getting honors as one of the, the best uh, arguers, I suppose, is what it was, uh, participants. And I... I ended up going back and on the ride home in the bus, I started thinking to myself, maybe I could do this for a living sometime down the road. I never really liked authority. I liked to argue. And so I think my friends were shocked. You know, I was a, a member of the surf club and track team and that sort of thing. And here I came back and they heard over the intercom system that I had one best arguer or best litigator, I think is what it was. Long time ago, this is in the 1980s, but that's what started me with a mindset of maybe I'll be a lawyer. So I'm always curious as to why people decide to become, enter the path that they enter. And with many, let's say, plaintiff attorneys, they don't like bullies, right? Whether it's some experience from their childhood, but was there something that, you know, because I remember you mentioned you'd always identified with the underdog. Why, why was that? You know, I, I don't know. I just always rooted for the underdog and I just didn't like authority. I wanted to uh, be empowered. When I was, I think, in, in fifth grade, uh, I wrote an essay and I called it Kid Power. And I thought that kids ought to have more rights. Uh, I think my, my dad fundamentally disagreed that the children in his household needed any more rights. But that's something that I wrote about when I was 10 or 11 years old about empowering those without power. And it's just something that 
was innate to me. I, I grew up in a, in a household uh, with a, an engineer as a father, and my mom was in the theater, so very diametrically opposed uh, kind of points of view. But we were always taught that everybody should be treated equally, and uh, in society, we know that that doesn't happen a lot of the time. So you graduate from the University of Florida. Then, I believe in 94, you, you moved to Colorado. And this was before they legalized marijuana. So what, what drove you to Colorado? So I had spent my whole life in Florida. I mean, I kindergarten through law school in Gainesville, Florida. And I was working in Orlando and in Melbourne, Florida for a small law firm. And I'd been out a couple of years. And like most lawyers, I, I felt like if I was going to make a move, I needed to make a move. Otherwise, I was going to become ingrained in the community and I would spend my entire life in Florida. Not that that would have been a bad thing, but I had just not experienced living outside of Florida other than I did a semester abroad, but I never lived anyplace else. But I had a, a problem and that problem was that I had made a promise to myself. In Florida, you take the bar exam in Tampa. I don't know if they still do, but when I went to law school, that's where the bar exam was given. And in school, there are people who, let's say, if they took a test, some people would walk out, your friends that say, I made a C, I made a B, but they, you know, what, then you find out they made like a 95, 98. I was always the kind that I could gauge, like if I blew a test, I knew I blew it. If I did well on it, I knew. And I took the first day of the bar exam. And I remember calling my mom and just saying, mom, I can't believe after seven years, I just failed the bar exam. I was like, I know I, I failed the bar exam. And she told me, you know, go back in for the second day. It'll all be fine. And I, that night I promised myself, if I pass this bar exam, I will never take another bar exam as long as I live. I hope this is the last test that I ever have to take. And so, I, well, I did pass. Okay. I passed. I remember going out to the mailbox and getting that and I passed the bar exam, but Florida it really has reciprocity with no one. They don't let other lawyers come practice without passing the Florida bar. And as a result, many states won't allow Florida licensed lawyers to come in and practice in their state without taking a new bar exam. So I looked for places with cities. I had no connection to Denver, Colorado at all, but basically it came down to Philadelphia, DC, or Denver were the three places that had cities that I may be able to go to. So my idea was I'll get in on reciprocity. And so I visited each of those cities, decided that I would go to Denver, didn't know a single person in Denver, decided I'll go for a year and see how it goes. And I figured I would probably be coming back to Florida. And I remember when I drove in the U-Haul across the Florida state line, my dad uh, took the trip out with me to move out. And I remember just thinking to myself, what the hell are you doing? All the people you knew from college, all the people from you, knew, you knew from law school, all the connections were all in the state of Florida. And here I'm driving halfway across the country. That was in 1994. And uh, I sit here speaking to you from my office in Denver, Colorado in the year 2021. So that's how I got out here. The other thing is, it, it seems like you were very entrepreneurial from an early age, or at least, you know, when you got out to Denver, from what I recall, you joined a Denver-based personal injury firm, but two years later, you left to start your own firm. So I'm just curious as to what led you to decide to open up your own practice. I was a kid who, when I was in middle school, went to Albertsons and bought in bulk candy bars and ice cream and came back to my neighborhood and set up a store in my garage and had my little sister, I paid her, I don't remember whether it was a quarter or 50 cents to drive around on her bicycle around the neighborhood, screaming about the fact and telling every friend that we could find that there was a store open at our house where they could buy their goods. And so uh, I've always had a, a kind of an affinity for the entrepreneurial spirit. And when I got out to Colorado, I, again, I didn't know anybody, but uh, in the back of my mind, I, I always thought about the idea of building a practice that would uh, be the kind of practice that I wanted it to be, as opposed to the kind of practice that somebody may, else might have thought about. And then on that note, so when you started the practice, you started it with Darren. I don't know that you, you guys would have imagined that you'd spent over 20 plus years together, but why was Darren the right person? Or I guess conversely, why were you the right person to Darren? 
Yeah. So Darren and I happened to be working in the same small law firm in Denver, a personal injury firm. I went to work for a personal injury firm the Monday after law school in Florida, and I looked for a job in a personal injury law firm uh, when I moved to Colorado. And Darren and I happened to be working at the same firm, and we got tasked with trying a couple of cases together. And frankly, we had to fight against the owner of that law firm with respect to the expenses that we wanted to put out to put on the case the way we wanted to put it on. So he and I tried a couple of cases together and it was during one of the cases that we first started talking because we had wanted to hire some experts and we fought with the owner of the law firm about hiring those experts. We finally got our way. We came in and we ended up winning the trial. And it was in large part due to the experts that we had fought so hard to get. And and all of a sudden, after we won, the owner of the law firm wanted to throw a party and congratulate uh, pretty much himself uh, for the fact that he had, had, had allowed this to be put together. And I think Darren and I just really had a vision, a coexisting vision, even though at that point, I think we knew each other 20 months. And Darren and I have been law partners since 1996. But Uh, We knew each other at the time, about 20 months, and we sat down and started talking about our futures. And I just said, you know, I had learned from a a very well-qualified trial lawyer in Florida for the first two years that I was there, even though it wasn't a long time, the right way to put a case together and to do things the right way and to put the client's interests first. And uh, I just said, "I, I just can't deal with the current situation. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm in if you want to do something. And it happened to work out great because Darren is a Denver native uh, and he played uh, soccer in college and came back to Denver for law school after being in college. And so it was a great mix in that I felt like I, I, I really understood the beginnings of how to put cases together. And here we had Darren, who is a, a native of Denver. How would you describe the dynamic between you and Darren, e- even as the firm has grown? What's amazing truly amazing is that here were two kids who knew each other for 20 months. And when we opened our law firm, it was just us, right? Like most people who open their law firm, it it was just us. And yet through all of the growth, through all of the years, we have never had a falling out of any magnitude. And here we are very type A personalities I don't think that I've ever raised my voice at Darren, nor has he raised his voice at me. We have gone from really just the two of us to a law firm with 27 lawyers and uh, more than 100 staff. And through that entire time, we have had a marriage that where we are very different in terms of people. I'm much more of an extrovert. He's much more of an introvert. We have very different styles, but it's been so complimentary It's just been really a a perfect match. I couldn't uh, have wished for a better partner. It's not, I I would do anything for him and I know he would do anything for me. We just really have had each other's backs forever. So for any law firm owner that's listening right now, let's say they they have partners and they wish to have this type of dynamic. How have you made it work so well all these different years? It's like you, you hear about marriages that work for a long time. And that is we've always been open and transparent with one another in terms of our feelings about certain things, but we've also been very respectful of the other person's opinions. And there's been compromise that has had to uh, have been made along the way. Things aren't always the way that I want them, and they're not always the way that he wants them, but we talk about things, we sleep on it, we come back together, and we reach a decision on a path moving forward, and we take that path. And we don't look back and we don't go back and question and say, see, you know, Darren, I told you so we should, that was the dumbest thing that you ever said. And we never should have done that. We just respect each other. And we are fully aware that the only path to success is through making many, many, many mistakes. And we have made thousands of mistakes And uh, half of them were my idea and probably the other half were his idea. And uh, we have lived with each other's mistakes as we have become successful in the process. While Kyle and Darren's firm has now grown to a team of over 100 people, their beginnings were quite humble, to say the least. I asked Kyle to speak more about the early days of Bacchus and Shanker and the obstacles they had to overcome. 
both of Darren's teachers, uh, parents were teachers. I came from a, basically a middle class family and So neither of us came from money. Now, we weren't from families where we were heavily burdened with hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans either. Both of our our families provided an ability for us to go to to college. We both came out with student loans, but not like you see some people coming out today with hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in student loans. But we had a great idea about this practice. We had a big problem, and that is where was the money going to come from for us to open the practice? And so truthfully, Darren and I sat down and said, okay, let's go back and find out how much equity we have in our, what were essentially our kind of starter houses, right? Our first purchased homes. So we said, okay, let's go see what they'll give us in home equity loans. How much money can we come up with to start this practice if we're going to do this? And so we both did that and we came back together, maybe, I don't know how long, however long that takes, six weeks or what have you, and came back and Darren says, well, Kyle, I have exactly zero dollars of home equity that they're willing to make a loan against. And I said, well, I have, I think it was about $13,500 is in that range, under $14,000 in equity that they would make a loan against in my home. And so Darren and I sat down and put pen to paper, handwriting, I wish we still had it, we don't, where we agreed in writing that I would get the $13,500 loan and that Darren would reimburse me $7,000 if and when we went out of business, that he would owe that debt to me. And uh, we moved forward with that and as a result got a an executive suite. It was a single office for one person. We both, it was a 10 by 10 office over on Colorado Boulevard in in Denver, right in front of a Target store. And uh, we occupied that executive suite with one telephone and two desks. And truly, Darren and I went to lunch together nearly every day and ate at the Target cafeteria because that's about what we could afford to eat. We were paid $500 a month for the first six months of opening our business. And we challenged ourselves during that time to, uh, we took out a really small ad in what was then the Saturday TV guide, thinking that if people were hurt and home from work, that this is back before you could have a guide on your TV itself. And so you'd, you'd get the Saturday TV guide, we took out a little business card size ad that said something like auto accidents, free advice, and our telephone number. And we had about enough money to run that ad for a six month period of time. And that's how we got started and went to law offices and begged for them to give us the cases that they didn't want. You know, any case that you want to turn down, just give them our number next and hit the streets. And that's how we started this law firm. We had a very finite period of time before we were going to run out of money to start generating income. And I love that you mentioned that because there's on the podcast, we oftentimes hear about the eight figure settlements and all the wins and all those different aspects. But I I don't know that enough is spoken about, especially those early days of building a business and building a practice. You know, what were your expectations when you when you started the practice versus as, as you've described what it actually was, at least for the first, you know, six months, year and beyond? First, I think that for whatever reason in our minds, we really thought that we were going to be successful. We really believed in ourselves from the very, very beginning. We just expected to succeed. That being said, the truth is the very first case that our law firm ever signed up ended up going all the way to trial and we lost it in about 30 minutes in front of the jury. And we and we had to front the costs associated with that. Uh, so even though we had this internal kind of guttural feeling that we were going to be successful. We weren't successful when we uh, first started. We had no real basis upon which to believe that we were going to be successful other than the willpower that we were putting towards the project, right? And and just saying, we can do this and, and helping to support one another as we started running out of money and and just slowly started to to work and and we were able to keep the doors open and and grow. And I know you talked about taking that small ad out at the time, but even then in that, you know, in that time period, 
the sentiment towards lawyer advertising wasn't very great. I mean, what, what even compelled you in that moment to invest any amount of marketing dollars in advertising? We really understood, I think, that without advertising as a personal injury lawyer, the road is going to be much harder and much longer if you're just trying to organically uh, grow your practice. We really had some place we needed to be. And what I mean by that is we were going in, in, in this direction. And this direction was one to put ourselves in a position where we had a law firm that could take on the biggest insurance companies in the world, where we would have the money to not have to settle cases that should not be settled and to try the cases that should be tried. And so we were going in a direction and we wanted to get there as quickly as we could. And organic growth in and of itself was not going to get us there. And so we felt like we were either going to try to, with the limited assets that we had, we were going to try to jumpstart that and go there in the direction to build the kind of firm that we wanted, or it wasn't going to work. But again, we, we felt like it was going to work. And we wanted to be able to get into the yellow pages, but the yellow pages only come out one time a year and we didn't have the money to support a yellow page ad. And this was a week to week purchase that allowed us to, to get started and we grew our advertising uh, from there. We all have our ground zero, if you will. So we all start somewhere. If you're looking back over the last, say, 20 plus years, what are a few of the decisions you believe that you guys made that had the greatest impact on the success of the firm? So probably the, the first decision we made was to place that first ad in the TV guide, the small ad, and to, to stick with it understanding that advertising, but with a belief that advertising does work. And so that was the first one. Then the next big step that we made is putting up a website and remember the time frame here. I, I think that we probably had the earliest personal injury website in Colorado that we put up in 1997. And I think our, our domain name of coloradolaw.net was available to, for whatever reason, coloradolaw.com wasn't, but we had coloradolaw.net and we built a, a, this website. And a, at the time, then we started spending money advertising on a platform that was called like goto.com, which was the earliest of pay-per-click advertising, where at the time I was paying literally, I think, a nickel or 10 cents for Denver car accident lawyer or Colorado car accident lawyer on a per-click basis, which ultimately go to, I believe, was bought by one of the major search engines and incorporated into their, you know, after the banner uh, ad and the original internet uh, web, kind of the failure, the crash of internet advertising that was then picked back up with all the pay-per-click. So that was huge. As people migrated to the internet, we were there. And that was the first promulgation of growth of our law firm was being in that internet space and spending that money on the, what was that early pay-per-click advertising. And that we really became both a yellow page. Then we had money for the yellow page. We became a yellow page and internet based advertising uh, firm. But with the heart of our firm being, we weren't just going to be claims processors. We were going to be litigators. And so we wanted to, we believed you could play on both sides of that fence, that you could be both terrific litigators, and you could also be advertisers. And so that's the path that we pursued. That was huge. And then the next step was when we made the critical, huge decision to go on TV. Now, we got, we got to talk about this because it wasn't just the decision to go on TV. It was what that investment was for what period of time and what it was to you guys at that time, especially given you know the size of the firm. And I'd love if you would speak to that because this seemed like a very pivotal moment in the firm. You're right. It was huge. It was hugely pivotal. What happened is, again, here we are as this internet-based law firm from an advertising perspective. And we were not on TV and there were TV advertisers and then there was internet. And at the time, there was the beginning of this convergence of video being part of the internet. And so we had this big concern in our mind that what's going to happen with video and what's going to happen with the internet. And then something happened. And it was, I, I know when it was, it was in October of 2006 and it's Google bought YouTube. So here we were an advertiser on Google and they buy YouTube, a video platform at the time. Maybe this was going to be the future of TV. We didn't know, 
So what was video doing on the internet? Well, when Google decided, I think at the time, if you look it up, it was their biggest acquisition ever. They paid over a billion dollars for the acquisition of something called YouTube. And that hit me and hit me big. And I said, we don't know what the future is of the internet, but I can tell you the future of the internet is video if Google is buying YouTube, right? Where are we on TV? Is TV going to be what the future is? Or is the internet going to be TV? And we felt like we needed to be on both sides of it. And so we started looking in early 2007. And at this time, we had been a, a practice that had, had been successful. We'd been in business for 11 years at that point, had never run a TV ad. But now we said we need to be on TV because we need to hedge our bets about where is video going to be, right? And so we started looking into it and we met with several different marketing companies that marketed primarily for lawyers. And we had serious conversations about what it would take to be a real player in the marketplace. And again, this is a long time ago. It's much worse now, probably. But we had these discussions and we were shocked. But we talked to some very honest uh, marketers. And what we came away with was this. They said, look, if you're not willing to put up a million dollars to start advertising on TV in the Denver market. Don't do it. Don't do it. They said to us, if you do put up a million dollars to start this campaign in Denver, you're never going to see that money again. You may see other money. That particular money is going to be gone, meaning it's going to be spent before you ever start making any money off of this. And that was a, a real seminal point because that's a big gamble. We're going to put up a million dollars under the prospect of this working over the long term. And Darren and I, again, look at this. At this point now, we're, this was 2007. We're you know, 11 and a half years into our practice. We were successful. We were doing well. We were growing. The internet was serving us very well. But what was the future going to look like? And we decided we were going to go for it. And as a result of that, we made the commitment and the barrier to entry now in this market, I can't even imagine what it is. It's a very competitive media market. And we endured a very difficult uh, year where we, they were exactly right. You get these idea, this idea that you're going to put ads up on TV and the phone's going to start ringing and you put ads up on TV and absolutely nothing happens and you stick with it and you have to have faith and belief. And again, we looked at ourselves and said, well, what's the worst thing that can happen is that we don't have this, we, we lose this money. But the best thing that happened is, is that it helps us continue to grow with the idea that we still had and we're continuing to bring to fruition, which is let's put ourselves in a position where no insurance company can take us down because we have the firepower to continue to compete because we have the case volume and the monetary resources to compete at the level that we imagined back in 1996. Few firm owners have the commitment to invest a million dollars into a TV advertising campaign, but this was a pivotal and quite frankly, courageous decision that Kyle and Darren made. At the time, this meant pushing all of their chips in. I asked Kyle to elaborate on the scale of this type of investment to the firm at the time and how he and his partner were able to remain committed to it even when the phone didn't immediately ring. I think your characterization of all the chips in is a proper characterization. This was our willingness to participate in del serious delayed gratification. In other words, it consumed the vast majority of net revenue to the entirety of the law practice. In other words, we made a commitment to earn nothing and to lose money during the implementation year. We were willing to go into the red personally for the opportunity. Now, we also fundamentally believed that we had proven to ourselves that we could earn money doing what we were doing and that we were good at what we were doing. So it wasn't without faith and belief and it wasn't without like we could lose money doing this and have zero income for that year. But we felt like we could rebuild it even if that failed. We were not going to give up. We weren't going to close the doors 
we were going to move on to the next bad idea, probably, right? Until we could find a path to success. If you take bad ideas, enough bad ideas and execute them thoroughly, something's going to going to work out for you. And so this was a, another one of those examples of let's take the risk. And we felt like in talking to very smart people, some of whom you've had on this show already uh, at the time back in the day, talking to them about their practices, we really felt confident that we could weather the storm no matter where it took us. But for that particular time frame, you could not have taken a bigger risk as a practice than we took. And I'll go back to the fact that you mentioned that you had such a clear destination on where you wanted to go. I mean, the vision for the firm was there and also that commitment there I mean, in the sense that you wanted to be able to support your clients at the highest level and to have the resources to take on these insurance companies. So it lends me to believe that at some point you had to make a decision like this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that whether it was this decision uh, on the, the TV side or what the next level of growth was going to be, there had to be another decision. Because as great as we were doing with kind of the internet-based advertising, we're in a world of change. And we saw what happened with the Yellow Pages, right? The Yellow Pages, there are, are a lot of lawyers who used to spend hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars a year on, ever, on Yellow Page advertising that once that market started to dry up uh, with the internet, did they make the shift or did they ride the Yellow Pages to death, Right. John Morgan, I've heard him say multiple times. I mean, the stagecoach was a hell of an idea until what? Until somebody invented the car. And if you stuck with the stagecoach, well, you're not going anywhere, right? And so I, I, I think that all along the path of the history of our law firm, we have tried to stay on the front side of technology, the front side of the marketing curve, and to try to uh, make sure that we are committed to change, not committed to the same, but committed to change. Because if you're only committed to the same, then you're probably going to be Sears and Roebuck, right? That's committed to the same, to the death. And those that commit to change are committed to the future. So I know we talked about a lot of the good decisions, if you will, that have led to good outcomes. But I know you mentioned earlier that between you and Darren, you've made hundreds, if not thousands of mistakes. What do you feel were some of the biggest ones? I guess it depends on what you look at. From the business side of the practice, one of the biggest mistakes that we made was, frankly, answering, having our staff, our, a set staff, answer our own telephone calls and our own contacts for way too long before investing in a true call center environment. You can get the phone to ring. You might be able to get people to submit forms. If you're not responsive, you literally are, are flushing dollars down the drain. So we, for years, had a rotation, you know, the phone would ring and uh, whoever was available would pick up the telephone and start a case, right? We had a time frame. This was after we started advertising on TV, after we were moving in a, forward in, a, in kind of a path of success through our, our TV advertising. And we had a period of time over two or three months where the volume of new cases began to drop, not go up. I mean, we've had a lot of growth. And so when we started to see that, what we found out was that we had some staff members, paralegals, legal secretaries, and people up front who instead of, they were in the middle, let's say they were in the, in, in the middle of another project, they're answering the telephone and they were saying, we're not taking any more cases. Or can I take your number and I'll call you back? Okay. And we, we started losing out on those cases. And so we waited way too long to become big boys and big girls about the call center approach to managing incoming potential new client telephone calls and contacts. And that probably cost us $10 million, frankly, in gross revenue because we thought we were plugging along, doing this the right way. Because as soon as we shifted over to a dedicated staff and purchased call center technology and invested in people with call center experience, and we're not talking, I'm talking about a hundred person call center. I'm talking about you start with a three or four person call center to cover the hours, cover the time to make sure that if you're spending all of the dollars out in marketing, that you're being responsive, immediately responsive to the intakes. And we saw sudden growth. And all we could do is look back and say, 
wow, we weren't doing anything different in terms of our spend or our marketing. The growth was in the internal processes. And so that was one of a thousand mistakes that cost us a lot of money and a lot of growth. To further elaborate on that, because I'm glad you mentioned it in the sense that, you know, many firms believe that they have a marketing problem, right? They're not, they don't have the, the calls coming in that they want or the cases that they want. But in many cases, if not most cases, we found that really it's, you know, the marketing, you know, is the symptom, but the root issues are intake or the client experience or what's happening internally in the foundation of the firm. Have you seen this play out in other ways, even, you know, beyond the intake? Uh, Yeah, I think that it starts with the first contact into the firm, right? So one of the things that we have tried to do is we created internally what we call a client services committee. And what we do is we meet as a group over a lunch and we do this once a month and we've done it for years and we limit the meeting to 90 minutes. And during this meeting, we start with what's happening when a call comes in and we move through the entire process of a case. And we may not get through that in one or two months, may take us three months of time. And then we circle back and we start all over again. And we encourage, let's talk about what the experience is when the call first comes in. How quickly are we answering it? How responsive? What new technology do we need to be investing in to make it work faster, quicker, better? And then we move to well, who's meeting with the client and what's happening in that meeting? And so we, we work through each of these because every step of the process is an opportunity to succeed or fail. It may start with when the call comes in, but it, it's all the way through a process. And so one of the other things that we learned the hard way as we grew is how do we make sure that there's a consistent internal process for handling matters logistically. And I'm not talking about substantively. We want to encourage, you know, a wide range of voices and independence on our lawyers and how they want to put a case together. But the process matters. It took us way too long to dive into that and and really spend the time and effort to investigate each piece of the process from the client's perspective, not from our perspective, from the client's perspective and asking ourselves and starting. The first question we ask is, What technology can we buy to make this better? How can we use technology to make the experience better from the beginning through the end? And I know you've mentioned just even throughout this podcast that the constant really has been change and that constantly evolving with not just consumer expectations and needs, but even the legal industry as a whole. Where do you see the the future of the legal industry going? If, If we're even looking, you know, five years out or beyond, what will a law firm today you believe have to do to remain competitive? Well, I I tell you, I think about this all the time. It's a huge focus of mine. When I go to bed at night, when I wake up in the morning, you know, what what does the future look like? And to me, one of the things we've learned through COVID is that technology is king. What we've all seen in our business is if you're not instantly available and responsive, there's an instant way that somebody can take that out on you as an organization, that the expectations of the user are that things are going to happen fast, that the communication is going to be instant, and that there's going to be an ability to dig deeper, right? And so to me, the the future law firm is a law firm that is able to market, and we're in a, a much more fragmented marketplace, but follow the marketing and then instantly be able to sign up the case, start the case, immediately and to be able to communicate actively and intuitively with the client and to pre-think what they're going to be asking about and to create video libraries that can be served up to the clients on every topic that they may imagine that they may have a question about. This is not to take the place of individualized conversation, but to be an add-on to that conversation. I believe that they're going to want to be informed, that there's going to be parts of the process that they don't care to learn about, but that they are used to being able to research and look up anything. And what you want is you want to be that resource for them as they're looking so that if you say, oh, you want to learn more about the property damage? Let me send you a video on the, on the property damage. Oh, you have a friend that needs that video? Pass my video along. And so I really feel like where we used to think of, of lawyers and doctors as these in-person kind of intimate meetings, that that intimacy is going to be in some ways replaced by efficiency, that 
What's more important than shaking the hand of the lawyer is making sure that they have all of the information that empowers them to make the decisions with the lawyer. Uh, you've heard me say it many times today, like what technology can assist? And I think that, that if you are an old bird and you're getting older, you have to make sure that you got a whole, a young voice or more than one voice that really understands the technology of today. And 10 years from now, you're going to need somebody who understands the technology 10 years from now who can come in and tell you what is the best way to serve the practice. And that's why this kind of client services thing I was talking about where you loop back and you ask yourself, we just solved this problem three months ago and we just talked about it, but here we are talking again. How can we make it better now? What did we learn about the last iteration? How can we make it better now? And so I see the future as really technology services coupled with with law. That's how I, I really envision the future law firm is that it's as much a technology company as it is a professional services company. And Kyle, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? Well, listen, being a game changer to me means never, ever being happy with where you are in this moment in time for your future, right? In other words, you can enjoy, I enjoy uh, today, I certainly enjoy the fruits of our labor, but I'm not content with where we are today because I feel like as a, if, if you're not in the game to make change, right? So you use the words game changer. To me, those are important and sophisticated words. We're really in the game to make change to the industry in a positive fashion for those people who we are trying to help, or you're not going to be in the game. The game's going to be over. I want to give a huge thank you to Kyle Backus for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Kyle said that those who commit to change are the ones who are committed to the future, that the legal landscape is constantly shifting, and we must look ahead, pivot, and adapt to not only survive, but to thrive. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Kyle Backus, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time when we'll be talking to critically acclaimed author, world-renowned speaker, and international business phenom Eric Thomas, better known by millions around the world as E.T., the hip-hop preacher. Because it seems like the effort that my grandfather had to just grind and work, that effort doesn't seem like it's there anymore. It seems like more people want and wish, but they don't have that work ethic that we used to have. So I just believe, man, desire, desire and effort that's what a lot of people are missing. To me, that is the difference between surviving and legacy. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Mm-hmm.